examining our country, we believe that indolence does exist there. The Filipinos will doubtless not repudiate this admission. Only that, instead of holding it to be the cause of the trouble, we regard it as the effect. A hot climate requires of the individual quiet and rest, just as coal incites to labor and action. An hour's work under that burning sun is equal to a day's work in a temperate climate. Moreover, do we not see the active European abandon his labors during the few days of his variable summer, flee to watering places, sit in the cafes or stroll about? The Chinaman who in other colonies cultivates the soil does so only for a certain number of years and then retires. We find, then, the tendency to indolence very natural. The evil is that the indolence in the Philippines is an effect of misgovernment and of backwardness, as we said, and not a cause thereof. Others will hold the contrary opinion, but we have made an assertion and are going to prove it. Indolence in the Philippines is a chronic malady, but not a hereditary one. Before the arrival of the Europeans, the Malay and Filipinos carried on an active trade with all the neighboring countries. How then, and in what way, was that active and enterprising infidel native of ancient times converted into the lazy and indolent Christian, as our contemporary writers say? We have already spoken of the latent predisposition which exists in the Philippines toward indolence, and which must exist everywhere. What causes awakened this predisposition from its lethargy? First came the wars. It was necessary to subject the people either by cajolery or force. Insurrections were suspected, and some occurred, naturally there were executions, and many capable laborers perished. Add to this the continual wars into which the inhabitants of the Philippines were plunged to maintain the honor of Spain. Add to these fatal expeditions that wasted all the moral and material energies of the country, the frightful inroads of the terrible pirates from the south continually reduced the number of the inhabitants of the Philippines. In less than 30 years the population of the Philippines was reduced one-third. Man works for an object. Remove the object and you reduce him to inaction. Even were the Filipino not a man like the rest, there would still be left as another reason to explain the attack of the evil. The abandonment of the fields by their cultivators was sufficient to reduce to nothing the hard labor of so many generations. In the Philippines, abandon for a year the land most beautifully tended, and you will see how you will have to begin all over again. The rain will wipe out the furrows, the floods will drown the seeds, plants and bushes will grow up everywhere, and on seeing so much useless labor, the laborer will desert his plow. Still they struggled a long time against indolence, yes, but their enemies were so numerous that at last they gave up. We recognize the causes that awoke the predisposition and provoked the evil, now let us see what foster and sustain it. In this connection, government and governed have to bow our heads and say, we deserve our fate. When a house becomes disturbed and disordered, we should not accuse the youngest child or the servants, but the head of it, especially if his authority is unlimited. And the Filipino people, not being master of its liberty, is not responsible for either its misfortunes or its woes. We say this, it is true, but, as will be seen later on, we also have a large part in the continuation of such a disorder. The following, among others, contributed to foster the evil, the constantly lessening encouragement that labor has met with in the Philippines. The natives were not allowed to go to their labors, that is, their farms, without permission of the governor, or of his agents and officers, and even of the priests. The solid return the native gets from his work has the effect of discouraging him. The encomenderos made others give up their merchandise or cheated them with false measures. The pernicious example of the dominators in surrounding themselves with servants and despising manual labor as a thing unbecoming the nobility, those lordly heirs, and the desire of the dominated to be the equal of the dominators, all this had naturally to produce aversion to activity and fear or hatred of work. Moreover, why work? The curate says that the rich man will not go to heaven. Why be rich? It is ridiculous to work himself to death to become worse off. Add to this the introduction of gambling. The word sugal, hagar, to gamble, 
indicates that gambling was unknown in the Philippines before the Spaniards. Along with gambling, which breeds dislike for steady and difficult toil by its promise of sudden wealth, went also the religious functions, the fiestas, the long masses for the women to spend their mornings and the novenaries to spend their afternoons, and the night, for the processions and rosaries. And if this does not suffice to form an indolent character, the doctrines of his religion teach him to irrigate his fields, not by means of canals but with masses and prayers. It is well, undoubtedly, to trust greatly in God, but it is better to do what one can and not trouble the Creator every moment. The apathy of the government itself toward everything in commerce and agriculture contributes not a little to foster indolence. The government furnishes no aid either when poor crop comes, nor does it take any trouble to seek a market for the products of its colonies. What future awaits him who distinguishes himself, him who studies, who rises above the crowd? A young man won a prize in a literary competition, and as long as his origin was unknown, his work was discussed, the newspapers praised it and it was regarded as a masterpiece, but the sealed envelopes were opened, the winner proved to be a native, while among the losers there were peninsulas, then all the newspapers hastened to extol the losers. Finally, let us close this dreary list with the principal and most terrible of all, the education of the native. There is no doubt that the government and some priests have done a great deal by founding schools. But this is not enough, their effect is neutralized. The youth comes in contact with books selected by those very priests who boldly proclaim that it is an evil for the natives to know Castilian, that the native should not be separated from his Carabao, that he should not have any further aspirations, and so on. The Filipino is convinced that to get happiness it is necessary for him to lay aside his dignity as a rational creature, to pay what is demanded of him, to work, suffer and be silent, without aspiring to anything, a creature with arms and a purse full of gold. There's the ideal native. Unfortunately, the native protests, he still has aspirations, he thinks and strives to rise, and there's the trouble. In the preceding chapter, we set forth the causes that proceed from the government in fostering and maintaining the evil we are discussing. Now it falls to us to analyze those that emanate from the people. We can reduce all these causes to two classes, to defects of training and lack of national sentiment. The tyrannical and sterile education influences the mind, so that a man may not aspire to excel those who preceded him, but must merely be content to go along with, or march behind them. If by one of those rare accidents, some wild spirit, that is, some active one, excels, instead of his example stimulating, it only causes others to persist in their inaction. There's one who will work for us, let's sleep on. Say his relatives and friends. True it is that the spirit of rivalry is sometimes awakened, only that then it awakens with bad humor in the guise of envy, and produces discouragement. The natives spend their lives giving their gold to the church in the hope of miracles and other wonderful things. You belong to an inferior race. You haven't any energy. This is what they tell the child, and as they repeat it so often, it has perforce to become engraved on his mind and thence mold and pervade all his actions. To combat this indolence, some have proposed increasing the natives' needs and raising the taxes. What has happened? Criminals have multiplied, penury has been aggravated. Why? Because the native already has enough needs with his functions of the church, with his fiestas, with the public offices forced on him, the donations and bribes that he has to make so that he may drag out his wretched existence. The cord is already too taut. What we wish is that obstacles be not put in his way, that instruction be not begrudged him for fear that, when he becomes intelligent, he may separate from the colonizing nation or ask for the rights of which he makes himself worthy. Since some day or other, he will become enlightened, let his enlightenment be as a gift received, and not as conquered plunder. We desire that the policy be at once wishing the good for the sake of the good, without ulterior thoughts of gratitude. This policy has the advantage in that when the mother country loses her colonies, she will at least have the gold amassed, and not the regret of having reared ungrateful children.